Um, so yes, um, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizer, to thank the organizer for, for um, making this uh, month of workshop happening. It's wonderful, so, and it's very important to have people who are taking this in charge, it's very important, I think. Um, so, and um, yeah, and thanks for all of us to, to come um, um, this morning after the wonderful dinner from yesterday. So, and yeah, I've been asked to give an um, introduction to Twist Archery, um, and um, uh, as I tried to explain, this the, the focus is going to be maybe slightly different from the classical uh, literature. Um, well, I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by this, and I try to focus on relationship with dynamic making. Um, so yeah, some preliminary, preliminary comments. Uh, the literature on the subject is very rich. Uh, so you have these classical books, which are all very nice in different ways. You have different ideas here and there, which are very useful, but just to say that there is complete, comprehensive literature on the subject. Uh, I especially like those two uh, references as a starter if you want to learn the subject from scratch. Uh, so these three get and third books, an introduction to Twister of Siri. I think almost any people working on Twister Siri has read this book at one point. Uh, it's really useful as an introduction. And I also really like Tim Adamo's lecture notes. Uh, they were made, they are Modav's, Modav's lecture notes and they are way, very well done for, for as a starter. Uh, also, if you are interested in more recent results related to Scattering amplitudes and um, ambitwister strings, which typically are not covered. Well, I mean, this was happened before, after all these classical results. And there is this uh, very interesting re review paper by Atia, Zuniaski, and uh, Mason, which was made for the 50 years of twister theory. Very useful um, reference for gathering all different ideas that have been happening in the last 50 years. Um, okay, so all of this is very classical and they are very pedagogical and everything. Um, but this is not quite uh, what I'm going to follow here. And the reason, and I want to explain why, because I think it's also part of what is interesting in the subject. Um, the, the, I think, okay, this is my personal understanding on this, so maybe I'm wrong. So that my understanding uh, by uh, going through the literature is that it's part of the historical evolution of twister theory to go away from null infinity and to go away from gravitational radiation, to go away from this idea of asymptotically flat spacetime, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in a sense, I think, a huge part of um, what was Twister theory uh, in the beginning was trying to go away from this, trying to go away from scry, trying to go away from uh, ideas in the gravitational context, um, and, and import ideas from the setup into other setups. And um, this was, I think, I mean, this is what made Twister theory useful, is that you could take ideas from gravitational ideas, but then go beyond that in other signature um, and, and you don't need to, in, in fact, in, in Twister theory, you don't ever need to cry um, uh, or this sort of thing. And, and in this sense, uh, Twister theory, by forgetting about null infinity and gravitational radiations, uh, it became a much deeper subject. Um, and it, it, this is, it became what it is nowadays, which is um, just classical tools in four dimensional uh, pseudo Riemannian geometry. Uh, so you can perfectly learn all these things. And this is the typical way of teaching Twister theory. Is, not referring whatsoever to the existence of null infinity or Laurentian signature or whatever, because you want, you really have in mind applications which are much deeper, general and deeper than that. Uh, but, but probably for us, I mean, this was the useful process of the time, and this was how, what was probably very deep about Twister theory. But for, maybe for us, uh, for this workshop, where we maybe want to think of null infinity as being our starting point, and maybe, maybe that's more natural for you, uh, hopefully, uh, I think. Um, then, then it's not quite the way you want to, 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 to explain Twister theory. Because a lot of the ideas actually came from Scry, it came from null infinity. Um, so, so I'm going to, to sort of um, go in the reverse process of, the, of what, what has been done historically. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to try to, to present things in a way which really ties up with the geometry of null infinity. In a sense, it's very classical, it's the very beginning of the subject in a sense. And you might even say it's so regressive introduction which I'm going to give because I'm like going to go back to what uh, the initial idea but somewhat losing generality and, uh, and so in this sense it's not very standard because it's nowadays people are trying to go away from these sort of ideas I mean that was as I explained um, but hopefully it would be more in line with what you are interested in nowadays also the focus is a lot on scattering amplitudes and scry is back in the game uh, twister theory has been very useful uh, in this sort of setup we are interested in Carolian geometry and try to see how it relates so, so hopefully it will be um, this point of view will be useful for you. <clears throat> okay, the, so this is going to be my outline, um, but maybe do you have any question about this general? Um, so yeah, here's what I want to try to discuss today. So we're going to spend 
bit of time discussing what is crystal space and how it relates to Minkowski space and magnetic energy. Um, so I think you'll keep it at some time. Uh, then uh, I work all, take also some time on the Penrose transform, and you should here think that this is linearized field. So these two first parts are going to be linearized field equation. So, yeah, and hopefully um, at the end of the exposition, you'll, you'll get why crystal space is useful for encoding linearized field equation. And then once we have set up, we understand each other, um, um, and um, we'll, we'll go to, to nonlinear results, and mainly the nonlinear algorithm theorem, which is the cornerstone of of uh, crystal theory, and hopefully I, I have a time to, to discuss a bit more, um, going beyond self-dual sectors, so, um, bit of, and, and, and explain you how is this LW1 plus infinity symmetry appearing in this space. Let's start with what is the crystal space. So it all starts with exceptional isomorphisms, which is these things which I reviewed here. So this turns out that in four dimension, and crystal theory is really going to have to do with this four dimension, uh, you have this exceptional isomorphism for the conformal group. So SO24, which is conformal group of, um, of uh, Laurentian of Minkowski space, is also SU22, turns out. Uh, so typically, what you, we are going to do in crystal theory is that it's going to be a lot useful not to think about a specific signature, but to work with the complexified version of this conformal group. The complexified version of the you know, con complexified conformal group is SO6C, and this is isomorphic to SL4C. Okay, and typically what you do in crystal theory is that you work in complexified signature, and then at, the, at some point, um, because it's going to be more natural, a lot of details you can forget, and at some point you impose the reality condition that you want. Um, maybe you care about Lorentzian signature, so you will care about SU22. Maybe it's only if you're maybe more of a mathematician, you want to work Riemannian, or maybe split signature if you care about uh, maybe black holes or this sort of ideas. So, so it depends, but it's a good idea to, to work complexified in the first place. Um, Yes. Um, yeah, so, oh, oh, sorry, we say these are Lie algebra isomorphisms. Of course, if you want to work with a group, you have to be careful of discrete groups, but uh, not so important for our case. So, okay, and from this, you see, yes, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. So, just, just to see, yeah, yeah, uh, some, I will come be, could be coming to this space, but maybe I already say, because we care about null infinity in this presentation, uh, null infinity is not something which is going to be preserved by the conformal group. So immediately I'm going to break conformal invariance, which is what people would not do uh, in the classical framework, because usually you want to emphasize conformal invariance, but here we, want, we care about scry, so we immediately want to break conformal invariance, and we are going to choose a Poincaré group in there, and again it's going to, we, we choose a Poincaré group inside the conformal group, and we choose a Poincaré group complexified version into our complexified conformal group. Immediately we do this, it's going to be a lot useful to understand the thing. What do I mean by complexified Poincaré group? Well, Poincaré group in SL2C, so SO31, acting on R4. Well, when you complexify, R4 becomes C4, so this SL2C is doubled, and you have two copies of SL2C. Right? And in practice, so we are thinking, we should be thinking here of the Poincaré group as sitting inside SL4C, and here's, here's what it looks like. And it's going to be very important for all the talks to have this expression in mind, so I'm, I just write it up here to, just for, for us to remember. So this M is SL2C, one of the copies. The M tilde is another copy of SL2C. If you were working with a Laurentian reality condition, they would be complex conjugated, but here everything is complexified, so they are independent. And this T is translation. Um, reality condition was imposed that it's a uh, it's parameterized R4, but here it's just C4. And because it's in, we are thinking of it as inside the conformal group, inside SL4C, it's naturally acting on C4. So this is a parameterization of C4. So this mu beta, so this, you know, there are spin offs in this, so this beta dot, they go from zero to one. So this mu beta is a C2 element. This lambda beta is another C2 element. This is an element of C4, because we are thinking of Poincaré group as acting into C4. And this is our crystal space. So crystal space for us, uh, well, I mean, no, that's what, that's what the definition here in the flat context is. Crystal space is C4. And do you see why it's happening? Because it's the fundamental representation of the conformal group when, you when you're thinking of the conformal group as being SL4C. So, so, so tw a twister is, a is an element of the fundamental representation of SL4C, complexified conformal group. Um, but again, we are immediately breaking conformal invariance, and we are really thinking that Poincaré is acting on these twisters as follows here. Okay? Uh, and because, and now you see, here, when the Poincaré group is acting, the, the lambda, only the, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, only SL2C is acting on these lambdas. So, so it's, it's, it's Poincaré invariant to require that this lambda is non-zero, 
that I'm always going to do this, and this is what this means is that you take C4 minus a line. Okay, so what are these C's here? So the bracket here really means that we are that we are working with projective projective object. Thank you for knowing. And so if I have so this is an equivalence class, so I have this C4 element. And this is the same as another twister where I multiply by a number. A is a number. Right? So this is a homogeneous coordinate on CP3. Therefore, this lambda, which is non zero, is homogeneous coordinate on CP1. I'm always going to parameterize this lambda uh, with stereographic coordinates like this, just coordinates, so it's convenient. Um, just to, for, for us to have in mind that there is this sphere sitting here in the twister space. This is this lambda n to one and this. And as we'll explain very soon, this sphere is going to be important for us because it really is a point on the celestial sphere. We're really going to be a point as well. So just, just to make sure we are all on the same page, is there any question about this notation? Because now I'm going to systematically use this homogeneous coordinates. So C3, homogeneous coordinates on CP1. So typically, I mean, this means either you fix them forever or it's a function of time. Um, good. So that this is what twister space is for us. It's something which is in the fundamental representation of SL forces. Ah, yeah. And also, let me emphasize that what the fact that this M is just acting on lambda and that there is no lambda is not mixed with mu, right? Is just to point on a sphere where SL2C acts as the conformal group of the sphere. Another way of saying this is that you have a Poincare invariant holomorphic vibration, right? So these new lambdas, they are holomorphic because they are complex, but you can project and you project on this sphere. So, so twister space for us, I um, mean, in this uh, Poincare picture, um, projective twister space is this coordinates mu lambdas. The projective twister space. Coordinate mu lambda, so we have this projection on the sphere S2 just by just keeping the lambda, which means that each of the fiber, the fiber is just P2, and they are parameterized by these mu's, mu alpha dot. Okay, so you have this P2 fiber over S2. That's what the projective twister space is about, and they are so the mu's are parameterizing the fibers and the and the, the lambda as the base. And you see that all this makes sense because the Poincaré group preserves the structure as I'm describing it. Yeah, and you have more. So along the fibers, the mu's are uh, the coordinates along the fibers. But you see that because there is this SL2C element acting here, well, the, the mu's, they have something which is invariant, which is this volume form. Fancy way of saying it is that you have a Poisson structure on the twister space. You have this in inverse volume form on your, on your twister space, which is inducing a volume form, form along the fibers. So, so the flat twister space of Minkowski space is a, is a, has a holomorphic Poisson structure. It's also going to be important to keep that in mind at some point. It's just, so this is the flat twister space. And yeah, something I want, really want to emphasize is that this is structure of the twister space once you've broken conformal invariance. All these things are invariant under the Poincaré group. It would not be invariant. The fibration, you would not be invariant under the conformal group, and it's fine. Because this sphere, again, is, is going to be the celestial sphere, and the celestial sphere would not be invariant under the conformal group of Minkowski. So the, the, the celestial sphere in the conformal group takes points at infinity and brings them back. Yeah, please. Start from conformal geometry. So, I mean, a huge part of the result which I'm going to tell, they are fully conformal invariant A to Z. Yeah. 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 So, that's the thing is that I'm going to present results from what I've seen from Scry, so breaking conformal invariance. But the magic is that all of the results, a huge part of it, are, are conformal invariance. So, you don't need to talk about Scry, you don't need all this. Is, it's more for the presentation from for our understanding than than, than anything. Um, yeah. Okay. So then what? Then what? So the essential thing that we you, we should have in mind is where is Minkowski space in this story, uh, and the the the, um, 
The starting point of research theory is Plucker's embedding, which I think goes back to the beginning of the 90s. The fact that you can think of points in conformal compactification of Minkowski space. So this is conformally compactified Minkowski space. This is our physics world, where it's complexified. Um, and then, but this object turns out to be the same as some natural geometrical, ob geometrical object, which is the space of two, which the GR means Grassmannian, is the space of two planes in crystal space. And why is it important? I'm going to explain this, but why is it important? Because here you have your usual conformal group acting, but here you have this SL4C. So, so in practice, this thing is going to realize the exceptional isomorphism between the conformal group and the SL4C. So on the left hand side, we have conformally compactified Minkowski space, which is the picture you know. You're adding null, a null cone at infinity and gives you a compact manifold, S1 times S3. And, on the, yeah, and, and, and because we are breaking conformal environments, we know that immediately we get this conformal compactification, so S1 times S3, which is breaking between in Minkowski space, which I'm going to write with X, pi, U, Z, Z bar, and then time like infinity, space like infinity. We are working complexified, so it's going to be the conformal compactification of Minkowski splits into complexified Minkowski space, it's using C4, and then complexified scry. Comple what is complexified scry? Well, you have U, which is in C, and Z and Z bar, they are independent stereographic coordinates on the sphere. So you have two spheres, they don't talk to each other. And if you impose Lorentz, if you impose your reality condition, those two spheres, they become complex conjugated, and Z and Z bar, they are complex conjugated. Okay? So this is what we know from, um, from the left hand side, from the conformal compactification. What about this Grassmannian? What about this guy? Um, so here is how it works. So what is a Grassmannian? How do you work with planes? So a point in this Grassmannian is going to be a plane in crystal space. What is a plane? Well, a plane, um, we all know what is a plane. A plane is you choose a basis. So let me choose two crystals, ZA0 and ZA1, which is basis. Uh, and I'm going to represent them as a pair of twisters. But then if you want a plane, you don't want the basis. You want the basis up to linear combination. It's realized by the fact that you should mod out by GL2C, by the action of GL2C on the left-hand side. So this bracket here, they mean that you have a pair of twisters mod out by GL2C. That's a classical way of representing Grassmannian in, in general. Um, but um, so Grassmannians are like uh, hypersurfaces or sub, sub, the space of planes or hypersurfaces into some vector space. Here it's a Grassmannian of two planes. So I just have two less. Are we fine with this notation? Because uh, again, these things either here. Yeah. Yes, this little a, they are going to be zero one. They are just labeling basis, so they are my GL2C elements. Yes, so yeah, big A, well, yeah, you know, and not everybody agrees on convention. So, um, so big A are the the, um, the twister let the, the twister index for me. Alpha, alpha dot, they are the spinners in this, and this a b are GL2C Grassmannian. Okay. Any other question on this Grassmannian twister space? Yeah, this here, yes, that's what it is. Absolutely. Uh, no, no, that's what it is. Also, there is some sort of ambiguity by I mean, typically, so typically, people say T is twister space C4, projective twister space is CT3, but then depending on the context, you, you forget projective, or as I do, you want to really think of twister space as being CT3 minus this line. Oh, okay, so yeah, so there's a bit of ambiguity by what you mean by twister space, but in, in, in concrete you know, details, everybody understands what it is. Uh, no, well, okay. So, so no, so, so T is really a vector space, C4. So you want to think as the space of planes inside C4? Okay. Yeah, so there are, okay. So if you want to think in terms of projective twister space, um, this side is going to be the space of projective lines inside CT3. Because. Okay. Yes, because, okay. A point in CP3 is a line in twister space. So what is a plane in twister space? It's a line in CP3. Projective line. Yeah, fancy way of saying it. Yeah, yeah, in practice, you go from one to zero zero without thinking too much by using this type of coordinates. Okay, let me insist on this. So, um, so. <coughs> The point in CP3, in fact, well, it's, it's X, so it's, a, so it's a twister up to, uh, up to multiplication, as I wrote here, okay? Now, I want a pair of twisters 
a pair of twisters VA1, VA2. So it's a pair of twisters. It's a plane in C4. But therefore, when I model by C, in CP3, it's a, it's, a, it's a projective line in CP3. That's where I said. Yeah, yeah okay. Ah, very good. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I think here you see one advantage. Well, uh, I think here this is one advantage is that a point in space time um, is, um, is a line in CP3. Or maybe, yeah, maybe one advantage is that CP3 is compact. This, this has better property in terms as, as, as far as holomorphic properties are concerned. <laughs> Anyway, you know, this, this global scale, you never quite see it. That, that's, that's the point. Okay, good. Um, yes, so now, how do you see that, how do we see that it's a point in conformally compactified mean of two states? Um, yeah, so the remark is the following, um, is that, again, this second coordinates is Poincaré invariant. Because it's because just SL2C is acting on it, so you can project. Now, this object is a, it's a, this alpha, there are 0, 1 indices, B is 0, 1 indices, so it's a 2 by 2 matrices. The 2 by 2 matrices, but we are modding out by GL2C, which is acting on the right hand side. So there is very few invariants actually in this number. So, what is the only invariant? Well, actually, there are only three possibilities, which the, the only invariant which this, guy, this quotient encodes is the rank of a lambda. So, there are only three possibilities. Either this matrix is wrong too, and we'll see that then it will describe a point. In Minkowski space, or this object is wrong one, and then you'll see that this object is a point on scry, or this object is wrong zero, and it will be a point, it will be the judgment the point at spatial infinity. Um, okay, so how does that work? If you're wrong two, these lambdas they are invertible. You invert, you use your, your GL2C invariance to get rid of this lambda, and now your, your Grafenian coordinates just become this object, and x is your point on C4. Yeah, so this is how you see Minkowski space complexified appearing as a space of Grassmannian in twisted space. On the other side, if your lambda is rank one, then it means it has a kernel. You choose this kernel as the first vector, so now this lambda alpha b is lambda, is some new alpha lambda alpha zero. Your, your Grassmann coordinates become this object. You have two lambdas which are independent. If you look at this, you'll see that SL, they are just acted on by SL2C, and they are going to be points on this celestial sphere, S2 times S2. And then you might think that you have two coordinates left, omegas, but not quite because there is a bit of this GL2C invariant uh, left here. So only what, what only matters is the quotient of this object by this object, and the only invariant is this number u, um, and that's how you get the last coordinate on scry. Okay, so it's a very pedestrian one, pedestrian way of seeing the coordinate on, on scry appearing as in the space of Grassmann. Then last thing is lambda equals zero, and then you just get Good, um, so that's the summary of this part. Plucker's embedding is the fact that Grassmannian, the two planes in twister space, they are the same as, as the conformal compactification of Minkowski space. When you break conformal environments down to Poincaré group, you have this environment which is, which is the rank of lambdas, it's splitting your, your, your Grassmannian into, into three different orbits for the Poincaré group, Minkowski space, cry, and Z. So you're completely recovering the decomposition that you like. Um, um, conformal compactification, but as seen from twister space, good thing now is that what's acting on twister space is SL4C. So you're really realizing the action of SL4C on, 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 on this conformal compactification. That's, that's the main message. Um, is there a question on, on that? Good. <laughs> Very good. Um, related as follows. Um, so, yeah. So, you think, re well, before talking about this, take twister space, but now you look at true symmetric twisters, like two forms, two forms for C4. It's a six dimensional space. Already, six dimensional points to SO6. So, so, so you're looking at true symmetric twisters, true symmetric twisters gives you a point in C6. Now, what are, well, if you want Grassmannians, you want to look at two symmetric twisters that splits, which are just the product of two twisters. The invariant condition on it is to impose that it's simple, which is the following condition. 
Yes. Yes. And but the, but but the wedge on two form is a metric on two form. So so you start with two forms in C4, gives you an element of C6. The wedge product is the metric. Yes. So so you see now so you you have two forms, gives you C6. The wedge product is the metric, and then being null for this metric means that the vectors factorizes, which is a plane. So it's exactly the same. Um, yes. Any other question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, something that uh, we, you, which is important to have to, to keep to, to know here, is that there is also a Poincaré equivalent projection from twist space to sky, um, to, to Lorentzian sky, really. So how does that work? Um, well, you have to do the following thing. You keep. So I already told you that you should think of lambda as being a point on the celestial sphere. So that's fine. You keep this one. You can also have a point along the fiber u by taking this mu and contracting with lambda bar. You should think of this u as being a coordinate along c. Um, so, yeah, so and it's point carrying equivalent in the sense that you can check that if you act on your twisters like this with the point carrying group, you you're effectively going to realize the point carrying action on square. That's the key trick. This is how scry really fits into this story. If you have a projection of a scry. Um, yeah. so the, now, and I should say, you see here, you have only one sphere, not the two sphere of the complexified scry. So it's really the Laurentian scry which is sitting up here, not the complexified scry. Even though u is complexified, so sometimes people call this a half complexification. You're complexifying the fibers, u becomes complex, and the sphere becomes stays one, only one fiber. Um, yes, okay, so this is a summary of, um, of, uh, of uh, this first part on twisters. Um, yeah, again, is there any question? On, on, uh, then no, I will move on to linear activity. Exactly, we get some answers. So, as I said, these things are very well known to experts. I mean, this is, this, this is classical things, uh, but are never quite explained in this way because, once again, people want one precise conformal uh, aspect. Um, so if you're looking for a reference, um, we, we explain all of this. Uh, I mean, we reviewed this in this paper with uh, Nicolas Boulanger and Noemi Parini, where we, what we were really trying to do is, um, is, um, is work out the, the, the supersymmetric version of this construction. So, but you, you just strip up, strip, up, strip up the fermions and you recover this, this thing. <coughs> um, now, let's go to, now we have constructed what we've done. First step is we have reconstructed space time in terms of twister space. The next thing you want to do is you want to, 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 to realize the linearized theory in twister space. And this is going to be the content on, of, of Penrose transform. Uh, all goes back to this work of um, Roger Penrose, solution of the zero mass equation. And here is the main result. And I'm going to just explain what this means. Uh, is that now linearized field on, on, on your space time, conformally compactified space, space time, um, with any helicity, they are going to be in one to one correspondence. They are the same in twister space as some holomorphic object, which is a holomorphic cohomology group in twister space. I'm going to explain what this means. So you see, the, the moral of a story is that it's, it's like um, some sort of, you should think of it as, um, as, um, as a, some sort of Fourier transform. You go in another space, you know, describing your linearized theory uh, in a different way. Um, so how does that work? So it works for any spins, um, but I'm, for, for, practic for, for concreteness, I'm just going to work this out for you for a spin two. Um, so what's the, what are the, the, what, you know, the different bits here? On the left-hand side, we have linearized field. Uh, so for spin two, it's a linearized metric. It's a linearized metric, so you can use your usual Fourier transform game, and for example, think of it as being this uh, integrals of a Fourier, uh, Fourier mode. And it's just, again, I've, I've chosen a gauge where, where linearized field equations are just blocks of h equals zero. On the right-hand side, you have this uh, holomorphic object in Twitter space. What, is, what, what does that mean? Um, so first of all, um, the zero one means that it's a zero one form. So it's a zero one form. So I take this co the coordinate on twister space, and I, these are formed indices, and they are zero one. So only bars objects are allowed to appear. appear. Um, it's a but it's in it's in a cohomology group. What does this mean? It means that it should be a v bar exact. So it, this is a holomorphic zero one form, v bar h equals zero. But what you are really going to be interested in to, is into zero one field form up to forms which are exact. So that's why it's a cohomology group. 
look for 0, 1 form which are exact up to the one, well, sorry, you are, you are looking for 0, 1 form which are closed up to those which are exact. Um, so that's what uh, Dolvo cohomology group is on Twister space. Um, and uh, now you should ask yourself, where is spin hidden in this game? Uh, because uh, here spin was the number of indices, but where, is the, where are the indices hidden in, on, in Twister space? And they are going to be hidden in this extra, uh, this is where the, this extra scale that you're asking for is going to be useful, because they are going to be, so what this means, so let me say the fancy stuff and then I say what it is. So it, what this means is that the zero one form, they are, they are taking value into a line bundle. Okay, so the CP3, CP3 has natural holomorphic line bundle, and this object takes values in this line bundle, but in practice, it's much more, much simpler than, than, than the word suggests. <laughs> If you want that this H has a certain homogeneity. So here's the, the result or maybe the definition. So H is a section of this whole um, oh, S minus two. Just taking so O is a section of this, H is a section of this. What this means is that it has a certain homogeneity in the rescaling of the of the projective coordinates. So you rescale your Z your z bars by lambda and lambda bar. What you want is that this object is homogeneous degree to s minus two the spin of your linearized field is encoded in twister space in terms of homogeneity of the field um, in this homogeneous coordinates. Not alt integer. Alt integer is okay, right? So you mean here, huh? Yeah. If you mm -hmm. no, alt. Is that there? Yeah, that, that's the answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they are completely disconnected. No, okay, it's true that, okay, I should say this. Here I'm writing it um, statistically in a way in, by using the matrix. So the typical way of doing, okay. So for spin, Typically, you're producing the gauge invariant quantities, the vile tensor from this twister option uh, So there, and, and, and you still have this ambiguity in twister space. So the vile tensor is equivalent to, to this equivalent class of space. Um, so actually, there is a subtlety. So, so as you perhaps have seen already, uh, twister space is very chiral in the sense that it's very treating the, the two, the, the dotted indices and the undotted indices in a very different way. Um, so depending on the helicity as well, the typical, in practice, the equivalence for some elicities produces the gauge invariant quantity, and for some elicity produces the gauge invariant quantity. Very, so if you work for, for example, for spin two here, for S equal two is natural, the Penrose transform is quite naturally going to produce this linearized matrix. But for the spin minus two, it's more naturally going to produce the vile tensor. As you say, there is, uh, depending on there are different flavor of this Penrose transform, and sometimes they produce the, the gauge invariant quantity or, the, or not, but this D bar is, is some other gauge. Some, Okay, so, so yeah, I didn't display how it fits with scrag. Um, yeah, I think, <coughs> I, I think, yeah, so, so, yeah, so as we'll see, there is, a, there is a way to think of this twister alternative as coming from field that scry. And here I think that indeed, for example, the inhomogeneous BMS transformation would produce a term of this type, in this case. Yeah.
No, well, you, you have to, I mean, this, this, you have to write this down and then it's obvious. So, yeah. Maybe I have, I have some explanation from Scry, why it's correct, you'll see. Because, okay, as I explained, okay, so this is the class for story, but in practice, you can do a bit more. So, okay, so for spin two, here's, how, here's what the Penrose transform you look like. You take the zero one form, uh, and you integrate it over a sphere. Which sphere is that? When you take a point, you take a point in, in space-time, a point in space-time, remember, is a, is a plane in twister space, so it's a line in, uh, in projective twister space, you integrate over this line. So you take your zero one form, and you integrate over this, this line in twister space, and the result is a field on the point, and this is your, your, your linear edge field. Um, so it always works, and you have many of these Penrose transforms. So here is the gauge. Here I need to choose something. There is no, this iota is a fixed spinner which uh, I need to choose, and this is, this is the gauge freedom in this case. Um, and if you don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know because I've actually I'm presenting in this way, but it's the, typically you're producing the gauge invariant quantity. So yeah. one one thing you could do if you wanted the vital tensor instead, you take four derivatives and you get four alpha dot indices, and you, you're getting the gauge. Yeah, you never quite thought about exactly which gauge you could actually measure. But you can do more if you're um, if you're in your usual. Um, I think that this is five business because you can take the saddle point expansion, you go to scry, and we also know that you can represent um, the, um, the linearized field as being just characteristic data at scry. So this now, you, you, you can think of, of H as being just uh, sigma bar at scry, and it turns out that there is a very nice way of thinking of the twister representative in terms of the sigma, which is the following. Uh, remember that we had a projection from uh, twister space to, um, to, to, to scry, so on the other sense, you can, you can, use, you can do pullback. And, and, and this H, so the, the, the moral of the story is that the twister representative is, the, is morally speaking the pullback of the data at scry. You can go in a circle like this. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the picture. Uh, you have your linearized field, you go to scry, at scry you have this characteristic data living at scry. Maybe you know that here what you can think of the, of the, of the spin as some homogeneity on scry, and then you pull it back on twister space and this is your twister list. And um, yeah, I think maybe that's the, this is, so that's, this is the most constructive thing I know. And why, okay, why is it holomorphic here? It's holomorphic because you see mu bar is never going to appear. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's going to be sketchy, but that's the moral of the story, is that you start with u lambda, when you lift it, u is mu lambda. Actually, it's mu lambda bar, there's a typo, but it's just for, it's just, it was just for obviously. Uh, but mu bar is never appearing, so it's holomorphic in, in the mu bar coordinate. So this is space, so this space, that, that's what it's happening. No, it's a shear. It's really the shear. Can you? No, 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 no. no. This is this is for, but that's it. Yes. Okay, so, yeah. so, so, very good. So, um, I guess, okay, you start to go into the direction of which sort of, which space, which functional space do you want to consider or not, because it's all going to depend on what you want to assume on sigma. Right? So, so, so I think, Typically, uh, what you do is that you assume that this H is unitary for your Poincaré representation. When you do this, sigma bar has to be has to have finite norm at scry. So it's imposing that it's going to zero uh, plus or minus scry. So you're, you're, you're fixing part of the story. Then you could say, oh, maybe this object will not converge. Yes. Okay, let me say this. The theorem, it's not mine, it's Penrose's theorem, and it's been proved by a very serious mathematician, is that this is 
that this is an equivalence. So surely what's happening is that um, a generic, you can always take this use primitive when you're working in the correct container state. So then you have to say, you have to, well, you see, the question you're asking is which class of, of linearized fields you want to consider. Um, probably it depends on your. So, yeah, I think I know someone is very important for someone who's talking. I think it's a good question, but uh, it probably depends on the context. Okay, so in practice, let me just show you how it works in practice. Um, yeah, so one thing you can do is really work this out for, for the linearized field. So this is, this is your shear ascribed. As you may know, the twister list is just to replace, you replace this u by uh, mu lambda bar. And here you see that there is mu, no mu bar appearing now because it's, uh, there is lambda, lambda bar, but and mu, but no mu bar. So in this sense, it's going to be holomorphic. You might think that there is dz bar appearing here. It's true, but it's dz bar. So when you take the dz bar operator, it will not show. Okay, so that's why this form is, your, is the holomorphic one form in twister space. Um, Penrose transform is this integral, and it's a nice exercise to check that you recover that you want and that it all works off. So we have nicely fixed in your convention. Um, let me not, not do, do that. Yeah, so that's the moral of the story. Uh, you have this zero mass field on, zero OS mass field on, on Minkowski space, uh, zero one form with a fixed homogeneity in, in twister space, and at scry, it's the Arcarian fields with a fixed weight. Um, so these are you know, Arcarian weights or spin weights, depending on the way you're thinking. Here is the Penrose transform, here is larger expansion, Kirchhoff Dadema, and you have this twister list, uh, which you obtain by pullback, taking you from zero to zero. The story and again these sort of things is again absolutely absolutely probably the starting point of all the story it's very well known from experts but nowadays not, not very typically explained in this way um, and so in particular it's very nicely in this paper of Eastwood and Todd so it's a very good reference that you should keep in mind but we also review this in this work with uh, Laura Donnet, Laurent Fredel um, which hopefully I will time to comment on uh, in a little Because again, I think this is something I discovered recently. There is this very nice interpretation of the of the Penrose trends of the Penrose representative in terms of the data ascribed, which is completely hidden in the traditional way of, of presenting things. Because classically, usually you don't want to talk about scry. You want to do Penrose transform for any field on in, in any signature on on, on uh, onto the image for general general. Okay, good. So this was linearized theory. Do we have any? And I'm it's, it's, I'm not going to go into nonlinear stuff. So are we? Let's all set up on. <coughs> okay, so moral of the story was we had twister space, we constructed space time from this. We had linearized field in, in space time. Uh, well, now we, have, we know that there is this cohomology of zero one form on twister space, which are producing linearized field equation. Can we go beyond that? Can we do nonlinear theory? And the, the, the most important, probably the most important result in twister theory is that there is the same thing which you can. This is the nonlinear graviton theorem. Um, Penrose, and this says the following thing, is that there is a one-to-one -one equivalence. This is the same. On the one end, you have self-dual Einstein space times. I'm not going to explain what these are, to remind you what, what these are. Um, okay, there are different ways of phrasing this theorem. Um, here, I'm really to, going to think that you're producing this space time by doing deformation. You start from Minkowski space, and you're doing a deformation away from Minkowski space. Perhaps you're sending a, a small amount of deformation into, this, uh, into your Minkowski space. You're deforming it in such a way that you're producing an Einstein self-dual space time. Um, we can go beyond this, but you need to, then you need to phrase the theorem differently, and I don't want to do that. Um, and the equivalent version of this in twister space is that you, you're doing a, a deformation of the complex structure in twister space. So the deep, you see, what really was making the, the Penrose transform working is the fact that twister space is holomorphic, is complex. And it's holomorphicity in twister space, which was the equivalent of being of the of the linearized field. We have Penrose used that to to, to the extreme. Now we are really going to encode the full uh, nonlinear solution of self-dual sector of Einstein's equation in terms of deformation of this complex structure. And you need to preserve these things that I presented before, which are important, which is the, this holomorphic fibration and Poisson structure. How does that work? Well, first of all, what is a self-dual Einstein space-time? Uh, let me briefly remind you of what this is. Um, the starting point is to split two forms between self uh, you're in four dimensions, so you have the Hodge dual, which is acting on the space of two forms. Now you can look for the space of forms which are which which are which are 
eigenvectors for the Hodge duality. You have self dual two form and anti self dual two form. Um, and this here it's very important to work in complexified signature because if you're in Lorentzian signature, self dual and anti self dual they are complex conjugated. Uh, but in generic signature, they are not, and in, in complexified signature, they are completely independent. So split any of your favorite two forms into the, into the self dual and anti self dual form. The way to do this is to, is to introduce this basis of, of two forms, um, which you can introduce with sigma matrices or whatever you, think, you, know, you want to think of them. Um, but just important that we have a basis of self dual and anti self dual two form. And we are going to use this to decompose the Riemann tensor, because Riemann tensor is a two form. Well, one, one way of thinking of the Riemann tensor is that it's a two form with value into two forms. So let's do this. So the Riemann tensor is two forms, but two forms is self dual plus anti self dual, split anti self dual two form with values into two forms, which is again self dual plus anti self dual. So do this and you split your uh, Riemann tensor into four pieces. And here you have, you have this, uh, this is decomposition of the Riemann tensor into spinners. Um, so how do you read this? On the diagonal, you have this pure epsilon component, which is in practice, this quantity encodes the scalar curvature of your manifold. But we are going to be thinking about asymptotically flat phase lines. So it's just, this is just the cosmological constant. This lambda means cosmological constant is zero for us. Um, yeah. Um, okay, just to insist, this lambda has nothing to do with this lambda. Right? This, is, this is wedge product of two forms. I know, I, I know uh, I'm confused. Sometimes it's inconceivable. This is wedge product of two forms. This is cosmological constant. Um, Yes, so this is cosmological constant, which is zero, I, and this off-diagonal component is the Ricci tensor. Uh, I'm going to impose that it's Einstein, so this, these pieces are zero. So what is left? Well, you have this piece and this piece which are left, and these are the self-dual and anti-self-dual Weyl tensor. Self-dual Einstein complexified space-times means that scalar curvature is zero, which is flat, the Einstein, matrix, the Einstein tensor is zero, and also, the anti self dual part of the Weyl tensor should be zero. So all is left is the purely self dual part of the Weyl tensor. That, that, that's what it is. So sometimes people call them half flat metric because you see half of the Riemann curvature is zero. We just have one of one half which is in remains. So in other terms, self dual Einstein complexified space times um, is, is just the statement that you impose that the Riemann is completely self dual. Okay, so it's a subcase of all Einstein vectors. <coughs> so there is a question. I don't think I've really. Heard. So you're suggesting what about self dual gravity coupled with matter? Yeah, and maybe coupled with self dual electromagnetism. <laughs> No, it's a very good question. I don't think I've ever thought of anything like this, but I mean, I don't mean that there is a Yeah, if your question is to which extent the. Um, okay. I'm not quite sure that you did long. There is a version of the nonlinear graviton theorem for supersymmetric fields. So this, this for example, certainly exists. Um, yeah. So maybe that's one answer. It's, yeah, actually, it's the only example I know. But yeah, and I, but I agree. Version of, of twister theory, which would be interaction of self-dual fields without supersymmetry. Maybe it exists, but I, I'm not aware of that. But I'm, yeah, I, sus I suspect this would be complicated. Well, I mean, are you going to explain why you put no, I'm not going to explain why this one and not something else. I think that this is a theorem. Yeah. 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 Uh, the shear? Yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 of course. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's sigma where sigma is this delta AB object. 
right? I mean, yeah, it's it's quadratic in the in the metric. If you if you have a, if you have a frame, it's quadratic in. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. No, this this is just this is the basis of two forms. So I think probably in your notation you will, you, um, you 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 might want to it to 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 write it um, simply. You take your frame, alpha alpha yeah. dot wedge beta beta dot, and then you 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 you, you, you combine them. No, I'm not going to explain why, why, why this is making you think. Well, okay. um, ah, well, I'm going to give a different explanation. So, what is, so now we are coming to H space, well, because I want to, this is for us, the, the idea of this presentation is, is to think about scry. So how, how do you create to all these definitions related to scry? Uh, H space is going to be a following thing. So you, it's going to be an asymptotically flat space time. So for us, we are thinking of it uh, as an expansion in BMS coordinates. Um, so this sigma, remember we are in complexified signature now. So sigma and c tilde they are completely independent. In Lorentzian signature, they will be complex conjugated. They, each of them, they encode a different helicity. For example, this sigma tilde, as we, we saw in the Prenrose transform, encoded the linearized helicity plus two field. Um, and, and you see, if you compute, uh, each of them actually compute the different pieces of the asymptotic vial curvature, compute the different pieces of the phi zero. So if you want to impose that you are self-dual Einstein, this piece of the vial should be zero. And in practice, what you do is that you should kill this other part of the shear. So an, a, a space time which is asymptotically flat, self-dual Einstein's means that you're killing half of the shear. And of course, it doesn't mean if you're doing it in Lorentzian signature, it means nothing is left. So the only self-dual Einstein manifold in Lorentzian signature is Minkowski space. But if you go away from this, then, then you are free to, these guys become independent. You can kill with one and kill the other. Um, so you're really keeping just half of the degrees of freedom. Also, um, if you're thinking in scattering perspective, this is like only keeping incoming plus helicity fields. So you're trying to do scattering theory inside the all plus sector, which maybe you know is completely trivial. There is no scattering amplitude in the all plus sector. It has to do with this theorem, with the fact that the all plus uh, sector is integrable. Um, yeah, and that's what I want. That's what we we call H space is a space time which is self-dual, Einstein, and asymptotically flat. A specific, specific class of the, it sits inside the, 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 the Einstein's equation, inside the nonlinear graviton theorem. This is space times which are asymptotically flat plus, uh, plus cellular Einstein. Why am I talking about this? So, because this was a huge inspiration for Twister theory, and I think for this, uh, for us, yeah, it's, it is of importance. Um, so, there was this classical result of Newman, which is the H space construction, which is the following. On the one side, uh, you take one of these space time which is asymptotically flat, self dual Einstein. So which, this is the one I want to call H space. But it turns out that the a point in this space time, in fact, can be identified with a solution of a partial differential equation, which is a solution of this differential equation. You take a CP1, a sphere, and you're trying to embed it into scry. Right? Scry is S2 times R. So you're trying to embed a sphere into scry. And, but of course, there are many such spheres, but you want to impose an equation, the good cut equation, so you want to impose this equation. And it turns out, Newman could prove that solutions of this differential equation are in one-to-one -one correspondence with points of the self-dual Einstein spacetime you started with. So right, start with your self-dual Einstein spacetime, you do your BMS expansion, you recover the shear, which is the initial seed for your self-dual Einstein spacetime, you use this seed as a source for your differential equation, you solve this differential equation, and you can prove that the solutions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the manifold, you have, and really in the sense that on the space of solution, if you want, on the moduli of solution there, you have a metric. This metric is self-dual Einstein. So there is this equivalence between points in self-dual Einstein space-time, H space, and solution of the good quote equation, H space. So the H space is this point, is a space of solution to this differential equation, which by Newman result is the same as a point in self-dual Einstein, Einstein absolutely flat space-time. Why is this important? Well, okay, beyond the, the so sometimes, first of all, sometimes uh, people create like a, a very free holographic type of idea. You're trying to reconstruct uh, your space times as seen from, from Scry. You're trying to think of a point in space time as some sort of geometrical object as Scry. But Penrose's profound idea was the following, is that in the same way that you're thinking of Newman's H space as being a point in this H space is a CP1 into Scry, the nonlinear graviton theorem, the essence of it is that you should, that is that a point in your self-dual Einstein space-time is going to be a holomorphically embedded CP1 into your project with Twister space. You take a sphere, now you're replacing this good cut equation as cry 
by just holomorphicity in CP3. You take this CP1, you're trying to embed it into your twister space, but you deform the complex structure, and you're looking for spheres which are holomorphically embedded. So huge constraints, but fortunately, mathematicians have been studying this for decades. They know a lot, and then you can run a theorem, and you can prove that you construct a spacetime in this way, and that this, this spacetime as a metric is still Durand-Shine, and then you have one-to-one -one correspondence. That's the essence of, of Penrose's theorem. But, but that's what you should have in mind. A point in your cell door space time is holomorphically embedded CP1 into projected CC, into the curve twisted space. Okay, so that was this part. I tried to tell you what's the, how do you construct this point, this, this object from the twister space? How, you, how do you deform the complex structure in practice? Uh, what, what, what should you do? Um, yes. Okay. Complexify. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, so this is complexified signature. Um, so this set of ideas we are used to produce new solutions. Uh, so there is another version of this for cell dual Younger's fields. Um, at the time it was influential because they could produce new solutions, cell dual Einstein in Riemannian signature. Uh, in the young mills case, they could produce this instanton uh, solution for young mills, for cell-dual young mills, global solution on this field. So, I mean, this was used, I mean, this was useful for, for Riemannian signature, that's what I'm saying. To produce exact solution for Riemannian signature. If you want to go beyond that, all plus, or all minus. So what about the physics? Yes. <coughs> so, as I explained, all these things, they are, there is nothing in Lorentzian signature, right? Cell dual Einstein means Minkowski in Lorentzian signature. But as I will say, so I'm going to explain. So this was a, a block, a problem for a long time in twister theory. What people could do, and I'm just going to briefly comment on this, is that in the last years they could go beyond this with by perturbative methods. Here we see what's amazing about this theorem is that it's an exact correspondence. You're producing a non a full nonlinear solution of an Einstein's equation, fully nonlinear, no perturbative, no nothing. That's, that's what is amazing about this part of the theorem. So if you want to go beyond this, since Einstein's equations are not improvable, you need to do something which is perturbative. Okay, let me just comment on how do you, um, what, what does that mean to do to complex deform the complex structure in practice? Um, so there are different way, many different ways of presenting this. In the literature, I'm going to present, uh, I think, what's the modern way of doing it, uh, which is um, due to, I don't know if it's due to them, but it's very nicely used and explained by uh, uh, Damo, um, Mason, and most recently in this paper with Atul Sharma. So in practice, you should think of the complex structure as being a differential operator on your on your on your on your on your complex manifold. Um, so so, it's a, so deep, this debar operator knows about the complex structure. Um, so how do, so if you want to deform it, the idea is to deform this complex structure. So first of all, it should preserve this Poisson structure along the fiber. It's part of what you want to do. Um, here, so you want to deform it by, by means of a Hamiltonian to preserve the Poisson structure, and, and so, so Hamiltonian is going to be a zero one form, and, and you, the idea is you produce a new differential operator on your complex structure by using by deforming the flat differential operator by means of this Poisson structure and this zero one form. In practice, that's how you're thinking of it. Here, of course, it's just a differential operator. This differential is integral, is integrable, squares to zero, uh, and therefore by the by the um, Nyerlanger theorem produces a complex structure, complex coordinates uh, in your new CP. Of course, all these trends I should emphasize are very implicit. They are existence theorems. Good. And this is so in practice, what people do nowadays is that you're thinking of cell dual Einstein space time as being a type of differential operator on twister space that you're modifying. Like this. Now there is this. For us, that we care about SCRI, there is a wonderful way of thinking of this, is due to, uh, is the notion of asymptotic twister space is due to, I think I'm told Sparling, but it's explained in this paper by Eastwood and Todd, is that asymptotic twister space is the idea that you should def use what, what you know, you, you have a natural Hamiltonian if you are at SCRI, is that you should use the shear as the Hamiltonian. So remember, if you have the shear at SCRI, you put it back in twister space, you get the zero one form, which would be your linearized representative uh, in twister space, now you use this one as a zero one form to deform the complex structure. So in a sense, um, what this is telling you is that you can use the linearized field 
to produce a nonlinear solution to Einstein's field equation. And if you are scry, it's not a surprise at all. It's like just, you know that if you are scry, the same characteristic data can be used either to produce the linearized field equation or the nonlinearized one. So at scry, it's clear that, that, that you could do it in principle by just by solving Einstein's equation, uh, but you're realizing this by, by in, in terms of the, no, in, the in this uh, um, embedding of CP1 into cluster space. Once again, this is just this particular, if you do this, you would just produce H space, so asymptotically flat self dual Einstein space time, but, but the nonlinear graviton theorem goes, goes much, much goes beyond that. You can produce, you don't need scry to, to, to have this theorem work. Yeah, that's it. Depends what you're doing, very good. Uh, so in general, it's not, in general, it gives you a differential equation of H, integrability of this complex space. Now in this particular case, for the asymptotic cluster space, where you take the data and lift it in cluster space, it's automatically integrable. It's on sort of a very specific case where it's automatic and there is no equation, which is in line with the fact that this is characteristic data we know about. No, well, it was a little more quick. Yeah. Yes, but again here, from cluster space, it's just automatically holomorphic. It's just this pullback which is making you cry. So, so, so again, again there are, if you're doing the, the classical twister nonlinear graviton theory, it will be a generic H, will produce a generic solution, not asymptotically flat, will have a differential equation, integrability condition on each H. So if, now if you're trying to produce this H space which are asymptotically flat, it's just, you're just going to produce them by using characteristic data, there is no, this, this is this magic of asymptotic cluster space construction. There is no constraints. You're just deforming it in terms of this free shear domain. Any question on, so on, on this on the algorithm? <coughs> So now, now that we have reviewed the classical results, we can try to, to discuss a bit more, uh, more, try to go beyond. Um, so I'm going to, to give you a glimpse of what um, some of the ideas that have been uh, developed in the last years. So as I've been uh, asked already by Andrea, so there is this, um, so you see, the self dual sector is incredibly nicely encoded in terms of deformation of the complex structure in cluster space. But what if you go to go to, what if you want to go beyond? So um, this problem of going beyond the self dual sector, encoding full Einstein's equation into twister space in the classical literature is known as the Googly problem, which um, I think need to be born in the UK to understand this joke. It's a, it's a joke about, uh, about how you, you throw a ball in, in cricket, I think. Okay. Uh, but it's something like you want to encode self dual fields, so throwing the ball in a certain way in terms, by, but, but it's Googly, so it's turning the other way around, something like this, I don't know. Where. Anyway, you want, to, you want to see self dual fields and anti self dual field altogether in twister space. And for a very long time, it was very uh, problematic. Uh, it was probably uh, says, nobody know, knew how to do this. Um, but what's been done the last 15 years or so is that people develop methods to go beyond this. But as I already said, by using perturbative methods, which probably should not be a surprise because. This nonlinear graviton theorem is a manifestation of the fact that the self dual sector is integrable. That's, that's how people would say it. And the integrability is realized by this nonlinear graviton construction. It's integrable because you see you have free data. You're just deforming this twister space into, uh, into the, well, there are different ways of thinking of it, but you, essentially, this deformation of the twister space is essentially free data. Um, so it's manifesting the fact that, that these nonlinear solutions, they are integrable. Um, if you, go, if, you, if you want to go beyond the self dual sector, well, you need to do something perturbative. This is what people have been doing the last 15 years, and I think there have been huge progress. But, and I don't want you to, to go out of this seminar thinking that twister theory can only work for with self dual sector. Whether well, it's not true, people can really go beyond that. There are different types of ideas that have been developed. So it's mainly by the group in Oxford uh, around Klein and Mason. Um, so you have this first idea was twister actions. You take the self dual sector and you perturb away from the self dual sector by using um, twister actions. Um, there's a, a whole a variety of them. Another idea was ambitwister string. You're trying to go beyond the self dual sector by using a string theory, which is computing perturbatively uh, scattering amplitudes uh, 
um, and, um, and there is a, a whole magic to it. Um, so as I emphasized several times during the, the weeks, I think this is a very important result for us because these ambitious strings, they are null strings. So, so the induced geometry on the, null, on the strings is a, is a null geometry, is a Carolian geometry. So there is a sense in which these theories are genuine Carolian string theory. And what they do is they produce scattering amplitudes of gravity. They do it in the most wonderful way. They produce the so-called CHY formulas, which are very compact formulas for endpoint gravitational amplitudes. So it's very deep results. So it's originally due to Mason Spinner and developed by, by his collaborators um, afterwards. Uh, but there is a bit of black magic to it. And most recently, uh, they developed what um, something called uh, Twister Sigma model, which I think the geometry and why it works is much cleaner. Uh, and is this what they can do now is produce scattering amplitudes on self dual background. So you, you, you're taking this self dual background, which is the integrable sector, and you're trying to do perturbation theory over this fixed self dual background. And is this type of methods they can do that uh, and, and write explicit expression for scattering amplitude of Einstein's equation, a full Einstein's equation, but over a fixed background, which is self dual. Um, yeah. I think this, this is sort of the achievement of a long work in history. Right now, it's the, what, the, what the best which can be done in, along these lines of this uh, 15 years of work. Um, here, I should say it's only semi-classical, but in the ambitious string, they claim they, could, they can compute two as well. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to say on this because I'm definitely not done. If you have any questions? No, it's Lawrence. These things are Lawrence insinuation. Ah, okay, in this sense. Right, right, right okay, okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I mean, so what people are used to doing in, in your email, sorry. So what people are used to doing in scattering amplitudes is to, is to analyze con continue anyway. So their momentum are complexified. So, so it's really not a problem for anyone to just scatter complex momentum. And there it's, then it makes sense to, 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 to scatter things on the cell dual sector. But indeed, if you're restricting to Lorentzian signatures, the only thing you can compute is scattering amplitudes, what you say. But I mean, the most new result is that you can do scattering amplitude, so perturbation theory for gravity. So here, in these results, they could do scattering amplitudes for full Einstein, plus and minus ABCD, but on Minkowski space. In this last result, what they can do is do scattering amplitudes, but on, on, the, on the curved background. Which is self dual. But then, yeah, then you need to complexify, otherwise, then you know. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is gravity. This is scattering of gravity on Minkowski space time. So it's another way to using twister methods to doing perturbative treatment of gravity on Minkowski space time. What else in there? So, I found, so, um, so for gravity, it doesn't work so well. But for young mills, it's very clean. You write the, the young mills equation as a Lagrangian for cell dual young mills, which you know is integrable by a theorem which I didn't explain, which is Ward theorem for cell dual young mills. And then, so this the first part is cell dual and is integrable. You go to twister space, and then and then you and, and then you so you write your long, young mills Lagrangian as cell dual plus a perturbation such that the total Lagrangian is full young mills. You take this Lagrangian, you you, you use some techniques to think of it as being a twister space Lagrangian, and then you, the, the cell dual sector is integrable, so it's just free theory for you, because you're using these twister methods, and you're doing then scattering amplitudes, uh, with in, you're, you're, you're thinking of full young mills as being a perturbation away from the cell dual sector. And what they could prove with this, for example, is MHV, what is called MHV um, formalism for young mills. So it's a particular way of, of organizing scattering amplitudes, which is more efficient than usual uh, perturbation theory for young mills. And you can prove this sort of, I think it was not the first proof, but it's very elegant and, uh, and uh, geometrical proof of the MHB formalism for, for dual young mills, for example. Another thing that they could have. No, 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 no. They have access to all scattering amplitudes. But it depends on the results. Sometimes they are more or less, right? But in this initial paper, I think it's a, it's a work of, uh, of 
in for yeah, this one, they have the MHV chromosome. So the idea is that you can produce any amplitude by gluing together MHV scattering amplitude. That's what the, the idea of MHV chromatism is that somewhere MHV is a building block, and you construct the other one by gluing. And one way to proving that to prove this um, the fact that it makes sense is to use twister theory, where you see that your 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 the only vertex you need to come to do the perturbation theory is the MHV vertex. In the in the twister Lagrangian, it's clear that this is the only vertex you need. No, no, you construct all the other by well. I mean, yeah, there's the, 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 the your, yeah, yeah, that's right. In the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian is cubic, so it, there is only MHV interactions, and you, you then you know that all interactions are constructed by doing this this primitive. Yeah, it, it, yeah. So, and this this MHV formalism was proved before by usual methods, but it's in twister space is completely geometric on the For gravity, this twister action story doesn't work too well. For gravity, you need to, to resolve this. To this. Okay, so now um, uh, I want to spend the last part of the talk discussing LW1 plasmic input symmetry. Um, so this symmetry was advertised in recent work of Preminger as being a natural algebra organizing celestial OP algebra. Um, you have an infinite number of Conformally soft theorems associated with them. Um, but, and then, um, so Strominger could see it just by massaging uh, operators on the celestial sphere, which by itself was a impressive achievement. Uh, and, but then, uh, Adamo, um, Mason, and Sharma, what they could show is that this is related to classical results in twister theory. And the way they, they, re they, they prove that is, to use the, is by the way of the twister sigma method. And the main outcome of this, and, and I'm going to explain that what it means now, is that this symmetry, which is very non-obvious in space-time, in twister space is, is, is very elementary. It's just going to be local in twister space. And it's just going to be some sort of diffeomorphism in twister space. Um, and then the second part of the story, and so what they could do is use, realize this in twister space, right, because they knew the a lot of the classical story there and use the twister sigma method to, to, to see how this symmetry is acting on scattering amplitudes. So with this result, they can really take the symmetry and, and try to act on the scattering amplitudes. Um, and um, yeah, and then on the other side of the story, there was this result of Laurent Fredel, Daniele Pranzetti, and Anna Maria Rattario. Maybe you've been, maybe Anna Maria, if you've been there on the first day of last week's talks, um, I think Anna Maria must have reviewed a lot, a big part of the story. Um, and, and the, what they could do is realize this algebra in terms of a bunch of charges at null infinity. So at null infinity, you have your character, your data at scry, and you can construct charges there. Um, okay. And the, the, the question is, how do they relate? Uh, and what, uh, this is what we've been trying to do with, uh, in this work with um, um, Laurent, Laura, uh, on LW1. Plus infinity is to, to try to, to see, to check, are these two, symmet are these two symmetries the same or not? Or, and it turns out that they are uh, related, and I, and I explain how we can check that. But before that, let me review the classical story. So it was known, in fact, much long before Strominger, um, but completely different perspective, of course, so it took some time to realize it was the same, it was the same that um, there is this result of Boyer and Plebansky that the, this symmetry, this algebra, really is a symmetry of the nonlinear graviton theorem. Um, but, and I'm not going to review it from this paper, but rather from uh, the presentation of uh, uh, Tim Adamo, Lain Mezan, and Atul Sharma. And here is, the, the take home message. Um, so the LW1 plus infinity algebra in twister space is realized in terms as an algebra of function, which must have the following behavior. So remember, so what was, what was the coordinates in twister space? The lambdas, they are function of z. So we, are going, so we have functions of z, but also it should be a function of mu. And we are going to require that this function g, which are going to be the generator of the algebra, they are holomorphic to mu. They are holomorphic, and therefore they have this Taylor series in mu. So mu, so one mu, so it's, it's a polynomial in mu, but in z, it's not holomorphic, or it's, um, you have a singularity, and you have a Laurent series. Or it's holomorphic everywhere but at a point, or it depends the way the thing works. You have a Laurent series in z, while you just have a, a, a Taylor series in mu. That's going to be the generators of the algebra. Simple as that. Um, and, um, and, and what is the algebra structure? Well, it's given by this Poisson structure in twister space, which was just this double d mu that I discussed before. That's it, that's the algebra. You have this function on twister space and they are just, um, this is the algebra. You see that the z coordinate is completely spectator in this algebra. 
And, and another a way of saying this is that it's a loop algebra. So it's, it's a loop algebra over the sphere, and all the, um, the non-trivial algebraic part is in this Z mu part, and is this, this is well known. It's learned by all this, but it's well known that W1 plus infinity is the algebra of the Poisson diffeomorphism on, on C2. That, that's what it is. You just take two derivatives and have this two symmetry question. Okay, so that's the algebra. So in particular, yeah, see if you, if you want to recover the Scrominger picture, what you should do is you take these mu's, you ex expand on the alpha dot indices, and this, you get this other generator, so and this gives you a dictionary between uh, data and uh, this realization, which is integral. Um, and what this means is that this LW1 plus infinity algebra in twisted space is realized as a, as a space of vector fields, as a space of diffeomorphism. In twisted space, it's just local. It's just a bunch of, of vector fields which are generating this symmetry on twisted space. Um, the point is that it acts, now you, you have this vector field, it's going to act on your cell dual Einstein solution by just deforming the differential operator. Take this differential operator, you take the lead derivative, and it's deforming the, 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 the nonlinear gravitons, differential, you know, the operator corresponding to the nonlinear gravitons. Um, so, 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 you see, in, tw in twister space, it's, it's uh, as nice as it can be. It's just diffeomorphism in twister space, which is deforming uh, the complex structure. Of course, uh, what's important to keep in mind here is that if it was just a diffeomorphism, you would not get anything. It would just be a change of coordinates, you would not get anything interesting. What makes this useful, the reason that you're changing the complex structure and therefore producing a new solution, is the fact that you have singularities. That in, you're in this lower series, uh, you have singularities which are hiding, and therefore this is, where, this is why you can produce a new so, so, uh, solution. All the magic is coming from this uh, singularity here. Mm. This is how you see that LW1 plus infinity is a symmetry of the cell dual set theory. Vector field in twister space which deform the complex structure and therefore deforming the cell dual Einstein picture. I think so, yeah. I think, th I think that's, that's it. Really. Of course, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the algebra level. So at the algebra level, yes, you can reason. If you want to go beyond, I don't know how much is there. I think you can, I mean, again, locally. At, at the at linearized level, I think it's, it's uh, yeah, that, that, that's the claim, is that at linearized level, you start with the zero, you start with nothing, you act with this symmetry, you can produce any any linearized gravitons. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Your folder is yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's correct. Morally speaking, it's, it's correct that since the idea is that you can get all solutions by acting with it. Current details is more, it's more, it's more subtle, and again. <coughs> so I think, yeah, I think that the more here is also somewhat that with this LW1 plus infinity algebra, you can you can parameterize the cell dual set, uh, you can parameterize cell dual gravitons. And I think that's the essence of Schrominger ideas, that you're parameterizing in physics algebra, you're parameterizing in cell dual set. Okay, um, so what these people could do is they could use this classical result, interpreted in the way I presented, use their uh, twister sigma model and uh, uh, to, um, to, to to, to act on the on the scattering amplitudes and try to understand how, how, how this works. I'm not going to do that, I just, yes. Uh, so in particular, what this means, uh, if you put together what I explained before on H space and this, this means that it's clear that there must be an action of LW1 plus infinity on the characteristic data. What you do is you start with a given shear, you list it in twister space, you act with your symmetry, 
you have a new differential operator, you run your nonlinear algorithm theorem, you go to Scry, you get a new shear. So it's clear just by reading, if you want, just by reading this paper of uh, Lionel, um, Kim, and Atul, that there is a LW1 plus infinity action on the data at Scry. The question that we ask ourselves with Laura and Laurent is, uh, what does it look like? I mean, okay, what, so this is a very abstract statement. So that was the idea of this paper, uh, is try not to consider the, the, the nonlinear algorithm theorem, but simpler setting of just linearized theory, and try to just run this argument that I explained before, and try to be very concrete, very explicit, and, 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 and try to see what you can learn on the way, and try to see how, look, how things look like. Uh, and here was the main outcome, is that you just run this, I'm going to explain how you, um, I'm going to explain how you get this, but this, this was our answer we had here. Um, you can give you a representation of this LW1 plus infinity algebra on the space of shear. Um, and here is, uh, here is the action of the, of the, of the your generator on, on, on the shear. So you have these numbers of derivatives. Yeah. Uh, so what do I want to, to emphasize here? Um, well, first of all, yeah. About, about the generators themselves. You see, what's important to have in mind is that these LW1 plus infinity generators, they are very chiral. They are, they are polynomial in z-bar, because you have a finite number of z-bar, but they are Laurent series in z. So they are treating z and z-bar in a completely different way. And that, and this is what, for those who were there for, um, for um, Andrea Pum's talk, this is the type of symmetry that you, which you would get. Things which are uh, polynomial in z-bar, but, but complete Laurent series in, in z. Gen these are the generator of the LW1 plus infinity algebra. Um, and, and, and then other important fact of these formulas is that they are local on the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere, they are just different derivative. So this form D is, is derivative on the celestial sphere. So they are local formula on the celestial sphere, but they are non-local on scry. So taking primitive integral along the, the, the null direction. So all the non-locality, so LW1 plus infinity was local in cluster space. And therefore it has to be somewhat non-local in space time because the relationship between the two is non-local. But Adscry is as minimum non-local. <laughs> it's local on the celestial sphere, but just non-local along the generator. And well, one thing I want to emphasize is that the way we are deriving this formula, um, there is no doubt, and we prove this in details, that this form of representation of the algebra is just geometric. You have this representation in cluster space. You run your machinery. You're producing these things. Therefore, they have to be be careful. But you, you, you can very easily convince yourself that they are representation of the algebra. Oh, because you have zero here. Ah, so good. Good question. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, you should think there are two different representations. You have, if you just take the plus two spin, to act with the algebra, this is the action. Yes. 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 Yes, but they don't talk to each other. Right? There are two different representations. Yes. Yeah. You see it. So it's Caro in many ways. I mean, it's Caro in the sense that sigma tilde and sigma tilde are, are treated in a different way. It's Caro in the sense that the derivative are. Only you mainly have you know uh, in D and D, you, you only have D bar derivative here, and D everywhere. So it's it's Carol in the derivative which appearing. It's these are very very Carol actions. Yeah. Yeah. So for for the lowest modes you have. Super translations, which are local, uh, super rotations, so to speak, which are local. So it's n equal one, two, and at n equal two, at starting n equal three, you get something non-local and you'll do anything. Yeah. 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 So I want to emphasize that you have only you know, generators here are very specific. They are polynomial in z bar, and they are not all super translations. A subset of super translations. Just to emphasize this. So, for example, BMS group is not contained, just the BMS group is not contained in the LW1 plus infinity algebra, just to be clear. You have the subgroup, which is very chiral, of chiral generator. Not even. 
Chicago con Yaren. So one of the SL2C is three goals. Yeah. Have, what you have is one SL2C acting on translation, but the very careful visionary version. Yes, exactly. So I'm missing half of the relation from the Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And the, and the twister reason why is that you see one half of the sphere is there in twister space, but the other half sphere is just not there. This other SL2C is completely disappeared. We run. Uh, so yeah, and I should say, uh, after all this, we stare at these formulas. We are happy with the formula. I mean, they look ugly, I know, but uh, when you actually do the computation, you're very happy to have this at the end of the at, at the end of the at the day. Um, so they are very, actually very compact formulas. And when you stare at them and try to look and, and try to compare with this paper, you realize that this is what they add as well. So it's it's a match. So actually, it turns out that the, the canonical action, uh, so I mean, you need to put a lot of uh, code here. They, 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 are, they have a huge tower of charges. You look at the quadratic charges, the quadratic charges generate the same thing. Um, okay, let me just finish on how we prove this, just to emphasize the, 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 the idea here. We start with a shear at scry, lift it in twister space with this procedure that I explained, act with the LW1 plus infinity algebra, we get a new twister representative, Penrose transform, get the lin new linearized shear on Minkowski space, do the large R expansion, and this is where you have to, to, sweep, to sweep quite a bit, which is just like the painful part. And then you get a new shear at scry, and by construction, it's the LW1 plus infinity active shear. And through all this, you, you know that you have constructed a representation of the LW1 plus infinity. I know how to answer this. Yes, yes. It will be discussed later. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. Got any more questions about who? Ah, yeah. Well, maybe if you're interested, this, this you can check that for n equal one and equal two and equal three, you know, compute. This is, as I was saying, super translation, Carol ver version of super translation, Carol version of super rotation. N equals three, you start to eat something which is non local. Um, yeah, and that's it. Um, so that, that was the, the outcome of this work uh, that we could obtain an explicit realization of this LW1 plus NT algebra on Carolian field. And so it's on linearized, linearized theory. And by construction, what this realization is, is a realization, is a linearized version of the, 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 the action of this, the symmetry on the self dual sector, as explained in uh, Adam, Omega, and Chama. And it is automatically a representation of the algebra. And we could check also um, in retrospect that it coincides with the canonical action of uh, Laurent, Daniele, and Anna. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.